The race for state office tonight, Republican Attorney General candidate Ken Cuccinelli. This is What Matters. Good evening, I'm Kathy Lewis. We continue our one-on-one -on -one interviews with the candidates running for statewide office, campaigning for your vote this November. We are very glad to have Republican Attorney General candidate Ken Cuccinelli joining us, and he is joining us by satellite from our public television station in Arlington, WETA. Senator Cuccinelli, thank you so much for taking time to be with us today. Kathy, glad to do it. I know it's a busy campaign time of year, and I, I very much appreciate the opportunity to have a, a little bit of a longer form conversation with you. One of the things we're trying to do in these conversations is to give our viewers uh, a look at the candidates that's more really than a look, but a real knowledge of where they stand on the issues and also who they are uh, as individuals. And I wonder, as I look at your, uh, your campaign literature and your website, one thing I notice about you is that you have a large family. You have a lot of children. That's quite true. I uh, so I like going. I like going home. I, I can we appreciate that. It's a beautiful family. I think you have uh, what? Uh, what? Thank you. Five sons and two daughters. Five girls, all born oh, first. Oh, I got it reversed. And then there, were, then there was a five-year gap to the boys, and we have two boys. Oh, uh, that's that's wonderful. Uh, you have been in the state senate now since I think 2002. Is that right? Correct. Uh, and I wonder, right. as you think about uh, the, the service that you've given in the state Senate, what is it that you've learned in that service from Fairfax County uh, that, that gives you the sense of preparedness uh, for the office of attorney general? Well, one simple thing that isn't necessarily issue related is that uh, I've had to be a very good listener to do my job well in Fairfax County. I mean, we have 10 state senators in Northern Virginia and I'm the only Republican. And uh, I've survived that way by serving my constituents effectively and responding to their concerns. So, you know, that's a, that's a baseline requirement for this job that's also important for Attorney General. You do do constituent service as Attorney General, and, and I would also expect to bring the same kind of limited government agenda to the Attorney General's office that I've championed in the Senate. As you think about the role of uh, the Attorney General, how do you see that role as it uh, fits into the, to the work of the Commonwealth? Uh, many times the work of the Attorney General is fairly quiet, but the attorneys and professional staff that work for the AG uh, are, in all, are in all the state agencies. And so you're participating in every major decision of state government you at least have a seat at the table for each decision being made. And there are some areas where the Attorney General has greater responsibility, such as in the implementation and enforcement, and my personal favorite, getting rid of regulations. Uh, that's a quiet area where there's a big impact uh, by the Attorney General on the economy of Virginia. Uh, when you say that's uh, your pers I'm sorry? No, go ahead. Uh, when you say that's your personal favorite, getting rid of regulation, uh, I wonder what are the regulations that you would uh, would move to get rid of? What do you think is unnecessary? Well, it, it's more the way the process is inherently set up to add regs without ever getting rid of them. Um, we have a, we don't use sunsets in our legislation very much. A sunset means that uh, this law will go into effect for five years, for example, and in five years it will terminate. So if it works well for the first four years, you'd expect the legislator, legislature to reenact it. Uh, we don't do that with regulations. We don't do it with much legislation. And so we have this system where there's o the government agencies are always looking, what new regulations do we need? But they don't ever look at what don't we need anymore? And those burdens remain on citizens and businesses, and they gradually become a drag on our competitiveness. And I wonder—that's so what I mean it, in that respect. I understand, but as you think about those, are there particular uh, are there particular regulations that you think are a drag on on the state right now? Uh, it's more the volume of them that have never been reviewed. Now, 
uh, former attorney general now, uh, now running for governor, Bob McDonnell, began a program of reviewing these as best he could. And I would like to uh, carry that forward and expand that review uh, in an effort to try and free up our employers and create a better environment for people who are looking at starting businesses. Mm. And I, I wonder, in addition to eliminating regulations, what are some of the other issues that you care passionately about and what is, uh, what is driving your pursuit of this office? Well, certainly uh, I care passionately about dealing with mental health issues. Uh, I've been the General Assembly leader in addressing those uh, for years before the tragedy at Virginia Tech, and I would expect to continue providing leadership in that respect. We should also uh, note from that the Attorney I, General's I, office. I think that you also have a very long history in working with mental health, even before you were yes. at the General Assembly. If I understand correctly, you've been an advocate Correct. for uh, the mentally ill for many years. That is correct, and uh, the reason I'm the General Assembly expert on it is because I have worked in this area for over a decade, long before I ever thought about running for the Senate. Uh, and it's reflected in my bills r right after the first year I arrived. I've had bills every year to try and improve our system. I've long recognized that we uh, have a lot, to, a lot of work to do there, uh, and I've, I've continued to do that in the Senate and. In the Attorney General's office, I would, I would certainly expand my leadership role in that mm. respect. I also uh, have taken a keen interest in delinquency prevention, juvenile justice issues. Again, long before I ever ran for the Senate, uh, I've been on the courts committee since I arrived in the Senate. So I've been involved in every single change to our criminal justice system for the last seven years, including trying to suppress gangs, uh, deter joining up uh, as new members into gangs. Uh, we have uh, toughened up our laws on repeat drunk driving offenders, sex offenders, especially on the internet, uh, as well as those who prey on the elderly, which tends to be in the form of fraud on the internet. I wonder if we could come back for just a moment to uh, the issue of repeat drunk driving. Uh, as I, I think sure. you know, we, uh, we, we talked to your opponent in this race last week, and he said his sense of it was that he was tougher on the, the uh, repeat offender uh, than you are. And I want to give you a chance to respond to that. Well, uh, unfortunately, I think he kind of makes these things up as he goes along. I have voted for 17 different drunk driving bills to toughen up our penalties and the process on drunk drivers. Uh, the only comprehensive rewrite of our drunk driving laws we've had in the last seven years was focusing on repeat offenders. So there's really just no basis for that kind of a claim. Uh, we've now gone to a system where we really focus on repeat offenders. This is this is a playing out of the 80-20 rule, where 80% of your problem is caused by 20% of your offenders. And we focused our resources on that population and have very effectively targeted them. And I would point out that this summer, uh, the U.S. Supreme Court uh, passed down a ruling, the Melendez case, on June 25th, that really threw a monkey wrench in our drunk driving prosecutions. And both my opponent and I are from Fairfax County. Uh, by mid-July, only in, a, in only a couple of weeks, we had already lost five drunk driving cases. And I called for a special session to fix the problem. My opponent called that a political stunt. That was, those were his words. Uh, fortunately, Governor Kane agreed with me and called the special session. And that was the special session we had on August 19th. Uh, and I played a key role in crafting the legislation uh, to try and attempt to solve that problem and to stop drunk drivers from walking right out of court who should be convicted. Now again, this is something that my opponent thought was a political stunt. So, you know, judge for yourself who you think is being more aggressive in uh, helping our prosecutors put drunk drivers away in Virginia. And just for our viewers who may not be familiar with it, the Melendez case, as I understand it, and please correct me if I'm, uh, if I'm summarizing sure. this incorrectly, uh, has to do with, uh, with the use of DNA evidence and the ability yes. uh, to bring the actual testers into the court and the lab techs and, and all the rest of it. And correct. That's and being in, in the case of drunk driving cases, that means breath techs, 
um, and those doing the lab analysis on blood samples. Right. So, and yes, the office is quite overwhelmed and overburdened, and so that's that's yes. uh, one of the issues that they're trying to to sort out. Uh, I, I wonder and again why we had the special session. It, and I wonder as well, since the special session, uh, one of the the stories that has surfaced has to do with a, a delegate from our region, uh, Phil Hamilton from Newport right. News. Uh, I want to ask you about that because uh, your, your opponent has said that uh, you're the only one who hasn't called for Delegate Hamilton's resignation. So I want to get your response to that and uh, right. get your position on that case that has to do with uh, the, uh, the sponsoring of a bill to get some funding for a center and then uh, emails that surfaced that seemed to indicate that there was uh, an issue around a job involved. So I want to get right. your response to that. Sure. Um, you know, we, we, we talked a moment ago about the Melendez situation. I think when my opponent said that my request for a special session was a political stunt, he hadn't read the case yet. In, in the case of Phil Hamilton, I don't think he's read the law. There are three options for the ethics panel that is presumably reviewing Delegate Hamilton's situation. One is they can dismiss it as trivial or no violation. Uh, two, they can refer it to the House of Delegates uh, if they believe there is evidence of an unknowing violation. And the third alternative is that it can be referred to the Attorney General for consideration of prosecution if there is what that ethics panel believes, a knowing violation. Uh, I'm running for attorney general. Uh, that reporting period for the ethics panel won't end until the end of December. That means that if they refer to the attorney general, it'll be either Steve Shannon or me who's going to be considering that question. Steve has prejudged the case. He has put himself in a position where he would have to recuse himself from consideration. I don't even think he realizes uh, up to this point that, that he as Attorney General, if he were to win, would have a role to play in deciding whether or not prosecution goes forward with a delegate in, in Delegate Hamilton's position. I think that uh, uh, people need to know that one of the roles an Attorney General can play is that of a judge. Not often, but in some respects, uh, the Attorney General sits as a judge. This is one of those instances. And I think it would be irresponsible if a reporter went to a judge, for instance, and said, hey, judge, what do you think about this crime scene we saw yesterday? Uh, what do you think should happen to whomever is involved in this? Well, we'd all be appalled if the judge would go out and say, well, I think we ought to fry the guy. Uh, this is the same judge that would have to sit and make a decision in the case. Uh, that's the role of the Attorney General in this situation. Uh, I think the responsible course is the one I've chosen, and that is to say uh, that this ethics panel needs to do its work. They need to be allowed to do a full investigation. Uh, and the people of this district need to be given the opportunity to make a choice. Uh, you know, I think that Delegate Hamilton is facing some unique challenges because of the circumstances here uh, and that's understandable but I trust the voters of Virginia and I intend to be a trustworthy Attorney General of Virginia and when cases come before me that I have a decision to make in you can bet that I'm gonna make a clean clear honest objective decision my opponent has already taken himself out of a position where he can do that uh, Senator Cuccinelli, uh, one of the other aspects of duty for the Attorney General has to do, as you, as you well know, with consumer issues. And I wonder if there are yes. particular consumer issues uh, that are very important to you and that, that you would uh, press in that office. Absolutely. Uh, first of all, one of the changes I've proposed to the Attorney General's office is to bring all consumer protection under the uh, auspices of the Attorney General. Right now, there, some of the responsibility is with the State Corporation Commission. Some of it is with the Department of Agriculture, uh, my personal favorite. Uh, and then there, there are five or six attorneys in the AG's office that deal with these issues. Uh, I believe we can streamline our responsive uh, elements of government to consumers by bringing them all under the Attorney General. 
Uh, then you can hold the Attorney General, an elected official, accountable for their performance in this regard. Uh, and I think we'll do a whole lot better in serving our constituents. Seventy percent of the complaints in the Attorney General's office are about the poor handling of consumer protection uh, concerns. Uh, so, first of all, I think we can do consumer protection better if we proceed with my plan. Uh, but your question was specific areas of concern that I have. And I would tell you that over the last couple of years, uh, my concern has, has exploded in the area of mortgages to folks who are, who are being put in mortgages that they can't afford. Um, and the people lending them the money ought to know that. Uh, we ought to be enforcing, in the form of consumer protection, um, uh, fiduciary obligations on those that are acting as brokers to lend this money so that po folks in Virginia aren't put in loans that they can't possibly afford. Uh, many of the loans made in the last few years assumed that real estate values would rise forever and that people would sell within a couple of years because it was the only way to finance things like balloon payments on interest-only loans. Uh, those are things that I think the Attorney General should be more aggressive with. And I would note I heard an interesting presentation from the uh, county administrator in Henrico County, and he's been there 20 years. And you know what he said? He said that he hasn't seen uh, a familiar name, meaning SunTrust Bank or BB&T, uh, a name that we would all recognize uh, as one of those outfits that has been lending to consumers in where they get caught in, in a high foreclosure rate. It's all these fly-by-night operations that opened up because real estate was booming. Um, they were bundling their loans immediately, flipping them uh, to investors onto Wall Street. And this is, this is a big part of why we ended up in the financial mess that we're in. We're talking with Ken Cuccinelli, who is a senator from Fairfax County and a candidate for attorney general on the, the for the Republican Party. I, I wonder as well, one of the issues that's been very challenging in your uh, in your general area there in Northern Virginia and in for which Northern Virginia is in some respects known across the country um, has to do with immigration and certain sections not Fairfax County True. specifically but certain of your neighboring counties have implemented some very very tough laws uh, around the issue of, of uh, immigration right. and I wonder what your your take on that is. Uh, well first of all Fairfax is a big place let me tell your folks where I live I live right near Manassas, right on the border of Prince William and Fairfax County. And Prince William has probably been the most aggressive county in Virginia in addressing uh, illegal immigration, particularly in the form of criminal illegals. Now what I mean by criminal illegals are people who are already here illegally who then commit a crime, drunk driving, robbery, you name it and they have plugged into the uh, ICE database. This is the folks who do immigration enforcement at the federal level now, and they have a local memorandum of understanding under what's called the 287G program. Uh, they had to invest a good bit of money, about a million and a half dollars in the first year to get their jail prepared for, for doing this processing, for training their personnel and so forth. And in the first year, they saved, now this is interesting, six million dollars in their school system. And that happened because a bunch of folks who didn't want to live with the threat of being caught for illegal immigration if they committed a crime moved out of Prince William County. And that kind of very legitimate, uh, untargeted, by which I mean you're not singling people out, uh, effort to deter illegal immigration in Virginia I think is very appropriate. It's something I support. Uh, in my time in the Senate, I've gotten four bills out dealing with illegal immigration. Uh, that's more than any other state senator. Uh, and the state Senate has proven very difficult in addressing this issue. And when I say dealing with illegal immigration, what we're talking about is the symptoms of it. Uh, in Fairfax County and much of Northern Virginia, and I know in parts of southeast Virginia as well as all over the state. 
we have what are called boarding houses where illegals will pile into a house more than the four family members, unrelated four members, uh, and they you've seen a, the, the houses with 10 cars parked in the front yard and so forth, and it becomes a center of trash and brings down uh, property values. Uh, neighbors are concerned about safety of their children, and in fact, you do have uh, criminal effects as well. Uh, we have given new powers to local governments to enforce their zoning laws. Mm -hmm. A well, simple thing like that that they didn't have before that tends to affect or allow them to affect uh, those who are here illegally because they're committing these types of offenses more than ordinary Virginians. Um, Senator Cuccinelli, I also want to ask you, uh, because certainly the Attorney General's office has the opportunity to weigh in on these issues from time to time, are there some of what we would call social issues in the four or five minutes we have remaining that are very, very important to you? Uh, well, right now, running in that office, the partial birth abortion case is headed up to the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, I would certainly defend Virginia's partial birth abortion ban. Um, that's going to have another year or two on that case. Uh, we won in the Fourth Circuit, but it was only 6-5, so it's a close case, and we'll have to see how we do in the Supreme Court. Now, an attorney general has the authority to just drop the case. Uh, we could just roll over for the plaintiffs and, and give up our partial birth abortion ban. Well, I, when I arrived in the Senate, I was one of the veto-breaking votes to get the partial birth abortion ban, so I'm certainly going to fight to keep it as Attorney General. Um, also in the bailiwick of the Attorney General is the marriage amendment. Uh, the only office left that matters in protecting our marriage amendment is the Attorney General's office. Uh, this is something that we're sure to see a lawsuit on in the next couple of years, uh, and if you look out at California, their attorney general is uh, the never boring Jerry Brown, who many people have heard of. Uh, he has said he will not defend their marriage amendment, despite the fact that the people of California voted for it. And that's his prerogative as attorney general. My opponent came out against the marriage amendment in 2006. Uh, I came out for it and campaigned for it. I think the legal basis for it is quite strong. And as Attorney General, I will defend it vigorously, uh, unlike my opponent, apparently. Uh, so those are the two issues that are current issues in, uh, among what I'd call social issues that are likely to be on the desk of the Attorney General or in the case of partial birth abortion are already on the, mm. on the table of Attorney General. The, I'd also say that we, there's one area I've worked in, and that's property rights, where I've been a strong advocate for property rights. Uh, and the Attorney General's office is looked to for leadership here, uh, and I intend to provide it, much as I will continue to provide leadership in the area of law enforcement, cracking down on gangs, uh, toughening up laws on drunk drivers, and going after Internet predators, especially those going after our children. I know the other thing you have, you have noted is that your goal is to put the budget for the Attorney General's office online so that people yes. can see it. Yes, I have been a strong advocate of openness in government, especially our budget. Uh, our budget process is so convoluted that uh, an ordinary Virginian would have a hard time going in and figuring out, you know, how much do we spend on fill in the blank? And I think that the owners of this government, the people of Virginia, should be able to figure that out in the 21st century. Uh, we've got the Internet available to us. I tend to think that there are uh, powers that be within government that would really rather not have that kind of oversight, uh, but we're going to try and lead by example by making that available for the Attorney General's office as much as we possibly can. Um, Senator Cuccinelli, is there a website where people can learn more about you and your campaign? Yes, absolutely. Uh, my website is Cuccinelli.com, spelled just like it sounds. <laughs> Uh, it's it's C-U-C-C-I-N-E-L-L-I dot com. And uh, for the spelling impaired, we, we also have <laughs> KC4AG, the number 4AG dot com. So KC4AG dot com will take you to the same place. So, so you've covered all your bases there. Well done. Yes. Well, I, you know, you have to face up to the reality of a challenging name with it when you're Cuccinelli. <laughs> The advantage is once people get it, 
I don't get mixed up with anybody else. I'm sure of that. Uh, I want to thank you so much for taking time off the campaign trail to be with us today from our uh, affiliate uh, WIDA in uh, Arlington. Thank you very, very much. Kathy, it's been great to be with you. Thank you for the opportunity. You bet. Uh, Senator Ken Cuccinelli's opponent in the race is Democrat Steve Shannon. He was a guest on this program last week. And if you'd like to see that conversation and keep up with all of our candidate conversations, you can subscribe to our video or audio podcasts at itunes.com. And you can also reach us online anytime through our website, whatmatters.tv. Drop us an email at whatmatters at whro.org. Join us on Facebook, and we'll be glad to send you an e-bit each week with a look at what we're working on. On the radio dial, don't forget to tune in to 89.5 WHRV for hearsay, and I hope you will join that conversation live each weekday at noon because we're always glad to have you there. Next week, Democratic Lieutenant Governor Candidate Jody Wagner joins us in the studio. Thanks again for watching. I'm Kathy Lewis, and we'll see you next week for another look at What Matters.